The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hekelah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakalah facing Jeshimon, for David, for, but David stayed in the desert. When he, saw that for, when he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped about him, around him. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Jehoiab's brother, who will go down with, into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the, ca- the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp, with his spear stuck in, to the, in the ground near his head. And Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has given your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. As surely as the Lord lives, he will, he, the Lord himself will strike him, uh, either in his time will come and he will die, or he'll go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw it or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were sleeping because the Lord had put put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Nor, No, aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord the king? Someone came to destroy your lord the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard the Lord your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and the water jug that was was near he, that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replies, Yes, it is, my lord the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done and what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord the king listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance 
and have said, Go, serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The King of Israel has come out, come out to look for a flea as one hunt, hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord gave you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son, David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way, and Saul returned home. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for reading all those hard names as well. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you for your word. And I ask that you'd help me to unpack it for us. That we might know what you're saying to us for this time and in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, I, I like these stories. They remind me of my childhood, looking at my uh, children's Bible with the illustrations that there were in it and uh, in, enjoying the drama of the story. Um, of course, at that stage, I was only getting it on one level, uh, the, the, the physical level, if you like. But uh, as you read it as an adult, you realise the, the spiritual enormity of passages like this one. So, David spares Saul's life. I would encourage you, because I put in, or Jill kindly put in the notice sheets for us, that I was going to look at two passages today. One was this one, and the other one was chapter 24. But when I looked at them again, I thought, that's just far too much to deal, deal with on one Sunday morning. So I really would encourage you to go back and read um, chapter 24, and indeed 25 as well, because they feed in to what we find David doing here in chapter 26. But in this particular place, um, chapter 24, has, which has similarities with this chapter, because again, Saul um, is chasing David, uh, but David refuses to take his life, has the opportunity to do so. But that, in that case, the focus is on not returning uh, evil, sorry, not returning good, for, or, re, or returning good for evil, get it around the right way. Whereas in this particular chapter, the focus is on leaving things up to God, leaving things up to God. I mean, I was interested, sort of Ailey was touching on this in her prayer as we were worshipping together about, you know, you can't, see, you can't see what's going on. You're struggling to cope with something sometimes. You need to leave things up to God. And that's hard. That is really hard. And there are all sorts of reasons why it's good to do that. Um, and we'll get to some of those in a minute. But David has been learning lessons through his life and indeed from what's happened in the previous chapter or two to do that in this situation that we find him in here now. And in chapter 24, 
when this whole scenario has, has played out the first time, at the end of it, you find Saul basically saying, OK, David, I'll leave you alone. I'm not going to pursue you anymore. I won't try and take your life. Well, we've read what happens. He can't keep to that. He's, he's so consumed by an evil spirit that he's determined to take David out. And it's only a momentary repentance, if, you, if, that's, if that's even such a thing. Um, and he's down now to his old tricks again. He's out there hunting David down. We would think that this would give David even more reason, wouldn't we, to finish the job. Finish off this man once and for all. I, I've lost count of how many times he's tried to take David's life. It's at least five But David doesn't see that revenge is something that he should take on board. I guess this is perhaps the first um, point for us to remember. Personal revenge never achieves anything. It never achieves anything. We must leave things up to God. If we take things in our own hands, then we're foolish. We need to learn from David's attitude. And if we're tempted to do that, then we must stop ourselves and learn strategies again to give them to God. You see, instead of something like personal revenge, there are three important areas that we can trust God in. We, firstly, we can trust him to make things right. We can trust God Secondly, to protect us. And finally, we can trust God with any reward we might receive for living for him. And David demonstrates all of those three things in this passage. Firstly, trust God to do the right thing, verses 1 to 11. How do you leave things up to God? Trust him to make them right. That means we must... Watch out, first of all, for our own temptation. Remember, it's God's job to decide, not ours. If we can't trust God to make things right, and if we insist on doing it, we will get it wrong. You, I'm sure you've got examples in your own eye. I can think of loads where I thought, you know, I could do something particularly for God and made a whole hash of it. So I was tempted myself to do the right thing. And this passage is full of those sorts of temptations. You know, Saul had promised to leave David alone. But then the Ziphites come to him and say, we've got information of where David is. And immediately he's off, tempted by the greater aim that he has. And so he's back to his old tricks. David is tempted also in this passage. He learns that Saul's back. He scouts out the area and secretly approaches Saul's camp. And he sees where the king and Abner, the commander of the army, is sleeping in the middle of the camp. And David is tempted to go down there into the enemy camp. And he takes Abishai as a volunteer with him. I mean, the they, the Bible doesn't tell us why they snuck right into the camp there at night. But maybe this was David lived, working out the temptation. Maybe even at that point, was he thinking, this is my chance. And yet, when he stands before a sleeping saw with a spear stuck in the ground, I mean, you know, it's there, ready. <laughs> it doesn't need any help. Except that Bishne says, I'll do it for you. He's definitely facing temptation. And yet at that point, I suggest to you, that would have been the easy thing to do. And, but he resists. So part of trusting God is to make right choices. To watch out for temptation. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And seeking personal revenge, which is what David probably was tempted by, is 
temptation. Secondly, remember it's God's job to decide, not ours. We live in a day where we can do almost anything we like. We are, we are gods of our lives. And so this is really hard to accept. It's God's job to decide, not ours. You know, Abishai asked David for permission to go and kill Saul right there and then. And Saul, David gives him two reasons why it's not right to do so. Firstly, uh, he's the Lord's anointed. And secondly, God himself will strike Saul. David knows, maybe it's a prophetic word, I don't know, but David knows that Saul's time will come. He will either die of natural causes or he will die in battle and perish. We know it was the latter God made Saul king, and David knows that it's God's job to take that kingdom away from Saul, not his. Even though he himself has been anointed as the successor, he knows it's not his place to interfere in God's timing. It would only be wrong for him to kill Saul. And so David sees it also as totally unnecessary, because it's not his job, it's God's. He doesn't need to get his hands dirty as far as this is concerned. He only needs to prove, that, if you like, that he was there by taking the spear and the, and the jug. David is absolutely right here. We're reminded in Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will replay, says the Lord. We leave room for God to do the things that God should do, and we do the things that we should do. Now, friends, I know how difficult that is. You know how difficult that is to try to measure up sometimes when, when we are supposed to act on God's behalf and when we are supposed to stand back. But in a sense, that's why God has given us of his Spirit. So as we listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are able to discern what God is saying that where we need to act and where we need to hold back. How do we leave things to God? Well, first of all, we trust that he will make things right. Secondly, we need to trust that God will protect us. And we need to commit our ways to the Lord. Firstly, we trust in God and not in people. We all know that people let us down. But the truth is God will never let us down ultimately. God take, um, David takes that spear and that water jug and they leave the camp and they make their way out without waking anybody. It's not because they're expert camp invaders. They've probably never done that in their lives. Who, who would be foolish enough to go into the enemy's camp? It's because God is watching out for them. He's protecting them. He's put the soldiers, we're told, into a deep sleep so that no one would wake up. And yet once they're safely out of the camp, David calls out to the army, especially to Abner, the commander of the army, and he rebukes him for not watching uh, out for the king and, of course, directs his attention to the two missing articles. The point here is that if you trust in God, not people, then the plan goes God's way and will be successful. They were perfectly safe because they were following and being protected by God. And on the other hand, Saul was being protected by Abner and 3,000 soldiers, and they were completely defensive because they were not trusting in God. You see the difference? <coughs> now secondly here, as far as trusting God is to protect us is concerned, that we must commit our ways to the Lord. In these verses, David explains that if God had told Saul to come after him, then David himself would make an offering because that would be God's will. And somehow he would give his life for his God. 
But if the men had done it, if it was a man-made thing, then they would be cursed before God. David had been driven from his own people, driven from his own land. He'd been driven to other lands where he could have been tempted by foreign gods. So which one was it? Either God has told Saul to come after David, or wicked men have done that. Either way, either way, David is going to commit his future, his whole life, into the hands of God. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. You know, that's the psalmist writing those words. If we commit ourselves to God, he will protect us. And finally, trust God to reward us. Doesn't necessarily sit comfortably, this one, with us, does it? Perhaps, I don't know. But the Bible tells us that God rewards all those who do right. David tells Saul to send one of his young men to come over and to get the spear. And then David proclaims, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. David has been righteous and faithful by not laying a hand on the Lord's anointed. Surely as David values Saul's life that day, David expects the Lord to value his own life and deliver him from trouble. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us of this in 6.10. He says, God is not unjust. He will not forget our work and the love we have shown him as we have helped his people and continue to help them. God will reward us. The reward may not be in this life. The reward may be in eternity. And then after all, we are to store up treasure in heaven, not here. So we don't necessarily look to for fame. We don't necessarily look to fortune in this life. That's not the reward we're looking for. In fact, I would suggest the greatest reward of all is to know that our Lord is pleased with the service that we've given. So just be careful about what the reward means. But God can make even our enemies be at peace with us. And that, after all, would be a great reward, wouldn't it? I mean, you may not have an enemy who's chasing you around the desert trying to kill you. I hope you haven't. <laughs> but surely there are situations in your life that are troubling you, troublesome. We all face them from time to time. God can make those enemies be at peace with us, whether they're situations, circumstances, or people. And it's Saul who gets the last word here, speaking words of peace and blessing on David, surprisingly. And then David goes away, and Saul returns home. And this is the last time, the last time they meet. Maybe there is final resolution. Maybe Saul has really realised that David is going to win whatever happens because God is on his side and he will not achieve what he wants. And as we'll discover next week, that is the end of Saul's kingdom. So when you think about this, how do we leave things up to God? Well, by trusting God to make things right by trusting God to protect us and by trusting God to reward us. You know, when we take matters into our own hands, we show that we don't really trust God. It's as, the logic is as simple as that. If we try to do the job for him, we forfeit any real protection on our own lives. We, we lose out on the possibility of reward. And we also actually prolong the conflict and miss out on the opportunity for God to make our enemies live at peace with us. And if that isn't enough, I don't know what is. If we're tempted to take personal revenge, stop. Stop and leave it to God. It's a good rule for all of life 
to leave situations with God. Trust him with our salvation, with our family, with our future, with our work, even with today. I'll finish with these words from Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with his graciousness, give us all things? God sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. I think we ought to be able to trust him for everything, don't you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example here in David's life of him having learnt through the lessons of his experiences that trusting you, leaving things up to you, was going to result in the best possible outcome. And thank you, Lord, that we can take these lessons from David's life and experience and apply them to our own situations today, even though it's many thousands of years later, even though our circumstances are completely different, you haven't changed, and the way you operate hasn't changed, and you still wish to work with us, your people, in the same manner. I pray today that you help us with this. In Jesus' name, amen.